Так, друзья, коллеги, добрый день. Я думаю, мы можем начинать нашу конференцию. Здравствуйте, коллеги, добрый день. Я думаю, мы можем начать нашу конференцию. 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 Я думаю, мы можем начать нашу конференцию with the welcoming part. I'm very glad that uh, immediately to give the floor to our highly esteemed colleagues and my, my superiors in higher school economics. Before I do this though, I would like to, to make a housekeeping announcement. Uh, make sure we'll have a simultaneous translation. So colleagues, uh, be uh, pay attention to which channel you choose. Uh, below it, uh, the lower part of the screen, there's a reference to translation. So you need to choose a channel which you prefer. If you want to make use of uh, translation to English, choose the English channel. If you want to uh, be on the Russian track, choose the Russian channel. But if you choose the Russian uh, language track, speak Russian, make sure you speak Russian. If you choose the English speaking channel, make sure you speak English when you, when you make a presentation. Otherwise our translators will be uh, confused. Uh, so, so after this short announcement, I have a great pleasure I'm passing the floor over to Ivan Prostakov, the Prior-Rector of High School Economics for uh, Welcoming. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Alexeyevich. Good day, esteemed colleagues. Let me say right away, I'm here not so much as the as superior official, as a professional interested in the topics uh, of our annual conference on the world economy, but as one of the heads of the high school economics, over the last few months, I've, come, I've been coming across a situation where online events, it's kind of sad because we don't get to meet people in person, but it's wonderful at the same time because it does help expand the geography and culture of participants. It's perhaps for some conferences, it uh, might be quite fair and equitable, but uh, it does not really concern our annual conference on the annual on the world economy, which is set by the Department of World Economy of Higher School Economics, because the quality of speakers, the high level, the geography, the stability of partners, among which are the International uh, Currency Fund, Monetary Fund, they're stable. Uh, and so it does not uh, is not affected by changes in the environment in terms of the tools of technical implementation. I think it mostly relates to the content, but not just the fact that it's interesting, that are wonderful specialists and experts uh, that get together to compare notes and share results of their research. The main thing is that this conference enables all of us to be more systemic in, uh, with our knowledge, with the results of our research. So let me remind you of just one detail, what our previous seventh conference began at. Uh, the first session was titled, what is going to be the next economic crisis? Of course, a year ago, nobody had an inkling as to how the events were going to uh, unfold according to this incredible scenario. But the fact itself that the question was formulated in this way, not in the financial terms, uh, because one who speak of uh, financial crises, uh, this emphasis on financial components, uh, which uh, serves as triggers uh, for too many economic issues. But what we were talking about, what kind of economic crisis was going to be and that's what we are witnessing now, witnessing a kind of crisis, financial components, uh, 
is just one of the elements and it's quite uh, logical it's quite systemic to begin the eighth uh, conference the session where the pandemic covid 19 is going to become the beginning of a world depression so the logic is quite uh, ironclad i think this is uh, there is strong uh, point of the annual conference which uh, i'll be uh, uh, staying in touch this is definitely advantage of using zoom so it's, it can be very flexible so i'll be i'll enjoy uh, uh, getting engaged in discussions and reports the main thing i'm looking forward to the ninth conference year from now which will be held in the, in any kind of format with a inevitable success so thank you very much for being able to despite all the difficulties we're able to get together wonderful audience great uh, express so I agree. Thank you very much and Valerich, thank you very much for your welcome uh, for your words of welcome i'm very much hopeful that the next conference which you've just mentioned will begin on a more optimistic note even though so far there are not so many uh, preconditions for that but let's not uh, speak of the deepening of depression that we're entering or any such gloomy uh, aspects i'm giving the floor to sergey karganov dean of the department of world economy world politics for the welcoming speech i do congratulate you on the next uh, conference that every year is getting stronger and its main uh, strength is that uh, it's not following the politically correct uh, scenario you are sometimes here you, you go against the wind uh, against the uh, current because the political science because uh, uh, the overwhelming political correctness uh, uh, values led to the economic science to difficult situation second thing uh, this conference, the previous conference, the question was not whether the crisis was going to happen. Everybody was felt quite sure that the crisis was uh, was pretty inevitable. The question was simply what kind of crisis, in what uh, form. So uh, look, so look at all kinds of aspects. There was no COVID, but other than that, uh, I'm uh, aware that my colleagues now are working hard on how to come out of this crisis so research has been has been commissioned uh, being done uh, by Mr. McCarth about the experience of uh, emerging from crises so i don't think that next year we'll be able to say that the crisis has uh, will have ended so i hope the next conference will be devoted to economics not not to hostilities or warfare because we were coming out from the previous crisis with the with the hostilities and warfare because the previous crisis began at 1929 and ended effectively with the world uh, uh, with the world war ii so we as a uh, military educated people try to there'll be no war so good luck you'll have a lot uh, of you thank you very much for your a bit uh, words and for good uh, words of uh, good wishes the next five minutes i'll be telling you about how the conference is uh, scheduled this year so that all the listeners would, uh, would have a good sense of our program now indeed we are going to uh, to, to start with the presentations uh, con concerning macroeconomics the question basically whether pandemic might start to become uh, the beginning of uh, world, world depression but uh, so introductory speech this uh, overview of the world step economy will be uh, given by a good friend uh, I am a representative from Russia, Annette Kionkiobi. After this, we'll have a session 
devoted to the current macroeconomic trends after a short break. If it were an offline conference, we would refer to this as a lunch break, but, but uh, being online, we won't be able to feed all our participants. But uh, however, however that may be, after a short break, we'll have uh, presentations on changes, on climate changes. We'll have a speech by Gemmett Fahn, a professor of New York University with a report on COVID-19 and uh, changes and speed of changes and after that we'll have a session devoted basically to coming out of pandemia context in the context of green development with the question whether the coronavirus time is a good time for, for these changes that will be done jointly with the laboratory economy of the high school economics this is the program for today tomorrow We'll have two more wonderful sessions. One of them will be devoted to social and dimension of coronavirus, to what extent COVID-19, on the one hand, is maybe a social catastrophe, on the other hand, maybe a driver of changes uh, as far as social policy in the in developing social uh, social well-being and fighting inequality and so on. After the break, tomorrow we'll have the fourth session devoted to the future economic rel relations between China and the USA. In English it's referred to as decoupling. So now we're thinking hard, hard to best to translate to this word in this context into Russian. It's more like a dissociation, economic uh, separation uh, or dissociation of China and USA. And uh, in the, the final speech will be done by Marko Milanovic, uh, visiting professor from the City University of New York with the report on the dynamics of world inequality in, uh, in income in the long term. He will be telling us also about the possible changes uh, of uh, such inequality. This is the program. I'll be happy to see you uh, throughout these two days. Also, let me remind you, we'll have a simultaneous translation. So we, Feel free to choose the, uh, the one of the channels that we have, Russian or English, for which purpose you need to press the button of, of the globe uh, underneath, uh, inside the Zoom. Um, but if you're in a Russian channel, make sure if you want to make a comment or ask a question, uh, put, it, uh, put it in Russian. If you're in an English-speaking channel, make sure you speak English only. If you want to ask a, a question of a speaker, make an active use of the chat we'll be reading it uh, uh, and we'll be reading out your questions to the speakers also um, you can ask for a chance to speak uh, live if you if you if you can call it like this then make use of the sign of raise your hand in the right hand uh, side of your window so press the button press the icon of participants underneath uh, in the Zoom, then the list of participants will, will pop out and there'll be also a special uh, mark, raise your hand. After you've done speaking, make sure you switch off your microphone, otherwise it'll make things more difficult for translators. So, these are the uh, short uh, announcements. Once again, let me uh, thank uh, Valerich Alexandrovich for their welcoming words, for their kind words. I'm very hopeful that uh, despite the fairly gloomy mindset in anticipation of the crisis, our conference will also feature not only pessimistic notes, but some optimistic notes as well. Because in any case, the crisis, of course, is not just uh, a, a blow to everyone, to all the world economy, to all the population, of our country, our planet, but there's also an opportunity to, to go to, to a new stage of development. Uh, because as the previous stage uh, accumulates lots of contradictions and the crisis, uh, and those contradictions tend to come out during the crisis. So the uh, opportunities, prospects, I hope we'll be able to discern uh, those two opportunities uh, and prospects even against the fairly gloomy background of events unfolding before us. 
So at this, uh, this suggestion, I give the floor to Anat Kiobi. Anat Kiobi is our good friend. I hope uh, it's, uh, it's become a tradition. It's the second year running, but uh, maybe it's just the beginning of a series of uh, speeches at our conference. Anna Kiobi is a permanent representative of the IMF in the Russian Federation. And I'm with great pleasure. I'm giving the floor. Dear Annette, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to uh, our uh, colleagues and uh, to, participants of, to the participants of our conference. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you are here with us and uh, that uh, you uh, were so polite to uh, take our, to accept our invitation. Uh, and uh, now the floor is yours, uh, please. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the Higher School of Economics. Uh, if I can just also uh, think back to, to last year when we, uh, when we had this conference where the discussion was around um, the global economic slowdown. But what I did want to, uh, I guess, specifically remind uh, was uh, Professor Leonid Grigorievich's comment about, yes, sure, there'll be a slowdown, but it's going to be uh, a black swan. And I think this was really uh, prescient at the time because, uh, I mean, the very definition of a black swan event is something that's of a disproportionate nature, very high profile, very hard to predict, and uh, basically a rare event um, that's beyond the realm of, uh, of normal expectations. And I think uh, we can unequivocally say that um, the COVID pandemic shock uh, is, in, is indeed that. Um, so today uh, I will present how we at the International Monetary Fund uh, view the economic outlook. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that we're a little bit more positive than uh, both um, Ivan Prastakov and Sergei Karaganov, and I really hope that, uh, that we have it right. Um, uh, so with this I will start the presentation. Uh, I will start um, with uh, a few slides on the COVID pandemic. Uh, so, so far we've counted more than 59 million infections and some 1.4 million deaths. Um, the, the pandemic has kept spreading uh, in emerging markets uh, over the summer. Uh, this is the red line, uh, but uh, the death toll has thus far uh, stabilized. Um, in advanced countries, we saw a lull in infections in the summer. Uh, but since autumn, uh, we've seen a massive resurgence of infections. Uh, this, is the, this is the green line that, that, that you see. Um, the share of deaths, however, uh, remain lower th than during the first wave. Uh, in low-income countries, this is the, um, this is the line uh, in blue. Both the number of cases and uh, the number of recorded deaths um, has remained significantly lower than uh, in emerging markets and in um, and in the in, and in the advanced economies. Um, however, undercounting is uh, is likely um, quite uh, widespread. Uh, in response to the uh, to the second wave, broad-based containment policies have been reimposed in a number of countries, uh, most notably in um, in Western Europe. Uh, and this is uh, what you see basically in the third chart. Here we plot uh, the the stringency index, um, which captures. Um, uh, the strictness of, of quarantine measures uh, that, that are placed um, against uh, mobility. Um, and what we can see is that uh, most of these lockdowns um, are, are much less strict than we saw uh, back in March, April, uh, but they're intended to stay in place uh, until the end of December. Uh, and uh, most countries are likely to keep uh, modest restrictions for a little while longer. Uh, given uh, the, the large degree of e both economic and social activity uh, over the Christmas period in, in most part of the world, um, how the economy looks like uh, in December uh, will be critical for both mobility and economic activity and also for uh, our annual uh, growth forecasts. Um, 
in response to the second round uh, of restrictions, uh, mobility has decreased, but uh, as you can see, not, not to the level um, that we saw in March, April. Uh, looking closer at mobility uh, across countries, um, we see that it's dropped significantly in the, in the last couple of months, uh, most notably again in Western Europe. This is the, uh, the red line, um, predominantly in Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. Uh, we see a similar trend in, in Russia, uh, in gray. Uh, but most emerging markets, uh, which are entering their summer months, so this is Latin America in yellow, countries like Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina uh, have seen uh, increases in mobility. Similarly, in Asia, uh, countries like Korea, India, and Indonesia are also seeing uh, uh, a steady increase in, in mobility. Uh, following uh, the increases in mobility, we've seen a steady recovery in retail uh, uh, sales volumes, uh, a steady recovering in manufacturing production, and also in services production um, over the summer through to October. Uh, but looking at uh, the more recent uh, high frequency indicators, uh, here um, we plot uh, October PMIs in red. Uh, this is this is the red part of the bar and uh, what you can see is that there's slowing momentum uh, at least in some of the major economies uh, with PMIs below 50 uh, showing a contraction uh, in activity in particular uh, in the euro area and and Great, Bit Great Britain here it's uh, denoted by the acronym GBR. The recovery in trade uh, has been uneven so far uh, global trade in goods uh, contracted sharply, uh, but is on course to recover more quickly from the pandemic uh, uh, compared to the, uh, to the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, in the left-hand side chart, uh, high frequency data point to a pickup in both the value and the volume of imports uh, starting sometime in June, uh, but the recovery has lost steam uh, since August. Uh, this trade outlook is particularly bleak for tourism dependent economies where restrictions on international travel together with uh, consumers fears um, of infections are likely to weigh on tourist activity even in situations where uh, the pandemic appears con uh, contained. Uh, here in the second chart we see indeed that services trade has not recovered and though the number of international flight departures has increased between uh, April and August, uh, this, is, this is the blue line, uh, the trend has already started uh, to reverse in, in early September. Uh, in labor markets, uh, employment dropped sharply uh, at the peak of the lockdown as, as seen in the, in the left-hand side chart. And uh, while it, it has rebounded in a few countries, employment remains far below uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the biggest employment losses uh, that we've seen um, have been, uh, for the most part, in the US, Canada, and uh, in emerging markets, uh, countries like Colombia. Um, employment losses are much lower in, in the Euro area, uh, for example, Italy and Germany. Uh, and this is a function of the short-term work subsidy schemes that were put in place uh, to preserve uh, employment. Uh, for those familiar with Russia, here it's uh, charted in, uh, I think that's dark gray, yes, in, um, in dark gray. Uh, as in past crises, what we've seen is that the adjustment in the labor market here has come through wages. Uh, but despite uh, the traditional adjustment uh, in prices, we've seen big increases in unemployment. Um, employment declined in Russia 2.2% in Q2 on a seasonally adjusted basis. I mean, it, it might not sound like a lot, but if you put it in perspective, um, this has effectively wiped out all the employment gains over the, over the last decade. Uh, this is, um, I guess, a little bit of a... Um, a foreshadowing of, of the analytical work that, that will be presented on inequality. Uh, but uh, what, what I wanted to show here is that uh, the pandemic has hit more severely low-skilled jobs, uh, further polarizing a labor market that has been polarized since uh, the global financial crisis. And um, here we see this in the, in the right-hand chart where we plot the, the change in unemployment rate by, uh, by education. 
And um, the second bar shows that the biggest increase in unemployment has been among those people with less than a, a basic uh, education. Uh, the least impacted and those uh, that have seen the smallest increase in unemployment are uh, those with, uh, with advanced degrees. So I think where, where our optimism uh, comes uh, on the recovery is around the unprecedented policy support uh, that, that national authorities and also at a multilateral level um, have, have provided to the global economy. Uh, fiscal measures uh, announced as of September uh, are estimated at $11.7 trillion. Uh, that's some 12% of global GDP. Um, half of these measures consist of, uh, of discretionary spending, uh, direct support to households, corporates, um, or foregone revenues in the form of temporary tax cuts, um, tax deferrals, uh, and the other half has come in the form of direct liquidity support, including loans and guarantees and equity injections by the public sector um, uh, to, to development banks. Um, Fiscal space considerations, uh, including financing constraints, have likely tempered fiscal responses to the pandemic in uh, both the emerging and in the low-income uh, group of countries, at least relative to, to advanced economies. And uh, the average discretionary response, uh, so this is the response that's not due to automatic stabilizers, such as an increase in unemployment benefits, for instance, um, has been about half the size uh, of that in, in, advanced, um, in advanced economies. Uh, on the monetary front, uh, interest rates were cut where possible. Uh, in the second chart, um, I plot um, uh, basically the, the monetary policy rate and the share of countries that have um, rates lower than 1%. And um, what we see here is that almost all advanced countries um, have been able to, to, to cut interest rates. Almost all advanced countries are also now at the zero lower bound. And uh, advanced country central banks have, have resorted to unconventional monetary policy uh, to support the economy. Uh, just, just to give you a, a data point, um, the European Central Bank has expanded its balance sheet uh, by more than 10 percentage points of GDP. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of context, I mean, this is a 40% increase with, with respect to the end of, uh, of 2019. Uh, many emerging markets have also been able to lower their policy rates in, uh, in, in this crisis um, compared to uh, what, what they've been able to do in, in past crises. And a lot of this is because of the extraordinary amount of liquidity that has been, um, that has been pumped into the global economy. Uh, but a number of emerging markets are also getting closer to the lower bound. Um, and this limits uh, the availability of monetary policy space uh, going forward. And uh, I guess what's new with, um, with the emerging market policy response in this crisis is that a number of EMs have also embarked on asset uh, purchase programs for the first time. Um, in addition to uh, the fiscal and the monetary policy response, uh, macroprudential policies were also employed uh, in this uh, in this crisis. Uh, things like you know cuts to countercyclical capital buffers, um, uh, things like um, regulatory forbearance on loan classification to encourage banks to restructure loans uh, to to customers and to maintain the flow of credit uh, to the economy. So all of these measures um, ha have gone some way um, to support uh, the easing of, of monetary conditions. And um, you know, what we want to highlight is this unprecedented policy response has been crucial uh, to limiting um, economic and, uh, and social damage uh, from, from this pandemic. Uh, with this, uh, let me turn very quickly to our, our growth projections, uh, which were made uh, in actually a little bit earlier than October, but this is based on our October World Economic Outlook. But um, because of the consistency uh, needed to, to make these forecasts, we start this process earlier. So um, a lot of the, I think most of the o October vintage data uh, actually um, has a data cutoff point um, of, of around August. Uh, so we'll see where, where these numbers end up um, 
towards the new year. But based on um, our October World Economic Outlook, we project um, a reduction in growth this year of, of minus 4.4%, uh, uh, but just relative to June, uh, where I think things were looking a little bit more dire because we didn't have um, any positive surprises, and we can talk about uh, that later in the in the Q and A. Um, global growth is still 0.8 percentage points better than we forecast uh, in June, and uh, the stronger projection uh, for for growth in in 2020 reflects the net effect of of two competing factors. So first, uh, the upward impetus from better than anticipated uh, Q2 GDP. Um, this is mostly uh, in advanced economies, uh, but also it, uh, it, it includes the uh, countervailing impact um, and downward drag from persistent social distancing and, and stalled reopenings uh, in the second half of this year. Um, in 2021, uh, we project uh, growth to improve or to rebound, excuse me, to 5.2%. Um, this is 0.2 percentage points below our June forecast. Um, and here, although a recovery has taken root um, in, in, in Q3 and it's expected to strengthen gradually over 2021, it's the recovery is still likely to be characterized by persistent social distancing until we get to the stage of um, vaccine distribution. Uh, looking at uh, specific country groupings, uh, growth um, has been most hard hit in, in, in advanced uh, economies and uh, we project for 2020 a hit to growth of almost uh, 6 percent, 5.8 percent. Um, this is a 2.3 percentage point improvement from our June forecast reflecting the stronger recovery in Q2 that I'd mentioned earlier. Um, GDP outturns for, for Q2 surprised on the upside in, in most of the large economies, um, but I specifically wanted to highlight um, the US and the Euro area, uh, where both economies, of course, contracted at a historic pace in Q2, but much less severely um, than we projected, uh, with, with the reason being uh, the massive government transfers uh, that supported household incomes in, in both the US and, um, and the Euro area. Um, so uh, in total for the year, the US is projected to, uh, to, to contract by some 4.3% uh, in 2020. Um, a deeper contraction is expected for the Euro area uh, at minus 8.3%. Um, the Asian advanced economies uh, are projected um, uh, to have somewhat more moderate downturns uh, than those of Europe in light of a more contained pandemic and also reflected in smaller uh, GDP declines during the first half of, uh, of, of 2020. Uh, for 2021, uh, the advanced uh, economy growth rate is projected to, uh, to strengthen to about 3.9%. Uh, uh, but what I do want to highlight is that it still leaves um, 21, uh, 2021 GDP for the group some 2% below what it was in, in 2019. And I'll get to this um, concept of, of permanent output losses to this crisis uh, in the next slide or two. Turning to uh, growth projections uh, in emerging markets and, and developing economies, uh, overall, um, the group is, is projected to, to shrink um, by 3.3% uh, in 2020. Uh, in, 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 in some countries, in particular China, uh, which has a big share of, of, of global uh, GDP, G GDP outturns in the second quarter surprised on the upside, uh, where after lockdown was eased in early April, increases in public investment helped boost activity. And uh, this was able to, to bring um, the Chinese economy to positive growth as early as, as the second quarter. Uh, in other emerging developing markets, however, uh, the news was not uh, so uniformly positive. Second quarter GDP was weaker than projected in a few countries. Uh, for instance, domestic demand plunged uh, following a very sharp compression in consumption and collapse in investment in India. Uh, the pandemic was, was particularly rife and uh, spreading very fast in Mexico. Um, and uh, in, in countries where external demand weighed um, 
particularly in exporting sectors, uh, we also saw a, a significant hit to growth. Um, the Philippines, for instance, saw a significant weakening of remittances, um, and this also waved on, 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 uh, weighed on domestic spending. Uh, for 2021, uh, we project a, a rebound in growth to 6% uh, in emerging markets. Uh, prospects for China are much stronger uh, than for most other countries uh, in this group, and we, we project uh, the Chinese economy to grow at 8.2% uh, in, uh, in, in 2021. Um, and just to give you an idea uh, what this looks like cumulatively, over 20 to 21, um, we expect a growth of 10% of uh, for China. Uh, looking specifically at commodity exporting economies, of which um, Russia is a subset, uh, due to the, the hit to commodity prices, in addition to um, the health shock, uh, commodity exporting economies are projected to, uh, to decline by 5.1% in, in 2020. Uh, let me draw your attention uh, to, to, uh, to Russia's projection. Um, the economic impact of the combined shock was, was severe, but um, what, I, what I do want to point out is that it was not as large as in other emerging markets um, due to perhaps a relatively small service sector uh, compared to other advanced economies uh, and, and other emerging markets. And also the larger share of protected public employ employment, um, both in, in government administration and in the large number of um, state-owned enterprises um, has provided some resilience to the economy. Uh, furthermore, uh, the, the fiscal and the monetary authorities provided a significant policy response. And uh, I think lastly, uh, the, the lockdown in Russia was, a, was, was more targeted, I think, than we've seen in, um, in other economies uh, where they provided um, a number of exemptions to, to many companies in, in the industrial sector uh, from, uh, from the lockdown. Uh, growth has been least affected in, in low-income countries, uh, and these are projected to decline 1.2% in 2020 before rebounding to, to 4.9 in 2021. Earlier in the presentation, I'd made a reference to uh, medium-term uh, output losses from, from the COVID pandemic. And uh, I think similar to what we've seen in, in other crises that have resulted in uh, permanent output losses, uh, the COVID pandemic is like to, likely to leave scars. Um, that is, we expect it to have an impact beyond the near term on, on the medium term growth uh, outlook. Um, and comparing projections, just to give you an idea of, of how big um, we expect these losses to be. Comparing the projections we made in January of this year or of uh, per capita cumulative growth uh, over 2019 to 2025, um, this is the blue bar, uh, to our projections now, uh, which is the red bar, uh, we are live, uh, we project only a, a partial recovery. For the world, um, back in, uh, in January, we, we, we projected a cumulative growth rate of, 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 of just slightly under 14 percentage points, uh, which compares to uh, 10 percentage points now. Uh, for EMs, the hit um, is part particularly large. Uh, we expect a growth of 22 uh, percentage points between 2019 and 2025, and this has now um, decreased to, um, to 16 uh, percentage points. And this is um, a, a similar uh, exposition of the argument and where we see the, uh, the largest um, expected decreases uh, or scars um, to the economy, it's, 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 it's regions like Latin America uh, and the Middle East. Uh, with this, I think I will conclude uh, the presentation just to leave uh, time for, for some Q&A. Thanks a lot, Annette. Uh, so we have uh a number of questions in chat already, and so I will uh, read them to you, and um, we will be happy if you if you may uh, ask them. Uh, so uh, I I will read several questions uh, at once, uh, and you will uh, be able to uh, answer them in any order you wish. Uh, 
So the first question, a question uh, in the current pandemic, do you think unemployment in the world will be uh, long term or short term? Uh, so probably whether the uh, jobs will return uh, right after the short recovery or they will uh, uh, last for a long time. What factors exactly might lead to the 8.8 uh, projected growth of India, which has the highest projected, projected growth in, uh, in 2021? Uh, the third question, should we treat uh, the current downturn uh, as the pandemic crisis only, or we face the cyclical global recession, which may last beyond uh, the pandemic? So the crisis is just uh, brought by the pandemic, or it is uh, it has some cyclical nature as well. Uh, and so another question, uh, given the various uh, limitations associated with logistics of goods and services and uh, different problems on the borders, what would be the role of uh, the WTO now in the time of the pandemic? So there are four questions, and uh, please, uh, please, if you, if you may, uh, ask them, uh, answer them. Thank you, Igor. Um, so I think I'll start with um, the the question on unemployment and whether uh, we expect it to be long or or short. I think basically our our views on employment will stem from you know what we assume in the baseline, and in our baseline forecast we do assume uh, a recovery uh, in growth in in 2021 across basically um, all, of, all of our economies. Uh, I think what will help, um, what will help the recovery, and I spoke about this in, in, in the discussion on the policy response, um, were the policies that were put in place by, by, um, by, by a number of countries. And I think, you know, perhaps in answering this question, I will focus on kind of what, what the Euro area uh, economies did, which was, to provide um, short-term work subsidies, uh, to effectively um, nationalize employment, uh, for example, in France, who um, you know, agreed to, um, to, to pay 80% of, um, of the economy's uh, labor wages uh, th throughout the course of the pandemic. So what this has done is it has um, allowed employees to maintain labor links uh, with employers uh, so that in the recovery um, you're likely to see a, a, a much faster rebound because you're not seeing these transition costs of, uh, of employees um, looking, for, uh, uh, looking for jobs. Um, the U.S. Went, uh, went, a, went a different approach um, and this is why we saw uh, very large um, uh, increases in unemployment uh, in the U.S. Um, rather than preserving this employer-employee link, uh, they went the way of providing um, uh, large increases in, in unemployment benefits. Uh, it's yet to be seen, I think, um, kind of which policy tool was kind of more or less um, uh, effective in this crisis, but uh, I, I guess with the U.S. response, um, you're likely to see a much quicker uh, sector reallocation uh, of labor uh, to to um, to where it's needed. Uh, so this also will um, will um, will will help with uh, with the recovery. Um, I think, depending on you know what 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 the world looks like um after the pandemic i mean there obviously will be some uh, reallocation of labor but i i think it's too it's it's too early to say i mean of course uh, you know virtual conferences are probably here to stay but people are likely inclined to to want to travel again so um you're likely to see uh, employment returning back to to the most affected sectors, but no doubt there will be some reallocation of um, of, of labor across sectors. Perhaps more labor moving to um, to the IT sector. Uh, so all of this to say that, of course, there will be some long un um, uh, long unemployment um, in the baseline. But um, I think predominantly we see this as, as mostly a, a short-term uh, impact of, of, of the crisis. Um, 
in India, could you clarify the question? I didn't understand if the question was why do we uh, project such a big hit in India uh, to to 2020, or why we um, or why we expect a, a big improvement? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. I can't hear uh, you. The question was, uh, as, as far as I understand it, uh, what factors uh, exactly might lead to the 8.8 .8 projected growth of India uh, after, uh, I, I think, in, in 2021. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know, I don't, I don't follow India very closely beyond um, kind of what, what Raghu Rajan has been talking about um, on India. And, um, but, I, but I will just say, um, I think it's, it's the, the growth rebound is on, a, on account of two factors. First, uh, there's just, you know, the simple base effect. I think India also saw one of the largest shocks to, uh, to growth in 2020. So you're likely to see uh, quite a big rebound. Um, but I think additionally, uh, the, the Indian authorities have used um, this pandemic to push through uh, structural reforms. I can't speak to the exact nature of the structural reforms. I, you know, I, I remember um, uh, something in, in, um, in agriculture, but uh, presumably our, our India team has, um, has incorporated also the impact of these, of these structural reforms in, in, in their growth uh, projection. Uh, the third question, was on um, whether or not we see uh, this downturn um, as cyclical or you know do we see some um, impact on on potential and I think uh, it's 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 definitely um, a mix of both uh, because you know different different country teams um, will project more of a cyclical impact. Others are expecting um, more potential supply side disruptions. And I think it's all very, uh, it's all very um, country specific. Um, so for Russia, for instance, we do, we do as assume uh, some reduction to, to potential, uh, but this is not a direct impact of, of the COVID pandemic, for instance. I mean, this is because uh, the authorities postponed uh, the completion of, of their national projects. Like they extended the timeline from uh, from 2024 through to through to 2030. So we've reflected that in our projections as a as a slight um, reduction to uh, to potential output. Uh, on the question of of um, of, of the WTO uh, and you know what role they play in logistics around goods and services. Um, I, I can't say much beyond our, you know, usual institutional view that that, that the WTO, as a, as a as a sister international organization, has a role to play um, in the global economy, especially in this juncture. Uh, you know, to to um, I guess encourage countries, you know, not to embark on trade wars, to encourage countries to. Um, to manage the distribution of the vaccine, but I, I can't I can't speak uh, to this question more concretely, unfortunately. Yes, thank you, Annette. And uh, yes, our uh, participants should understand that there are some uh, limitations uh, for Annette uh, for for express her views because of her. Uh, institution or institutional affiliation. But uh, the next question is. Uh, uh, is, is concretely about your institution, given the deteriorating economic conditions and the effect on the current accounts, uh, what measures were taken by uh, IMF and what is the potential scope of IMF uh, interventions during 2020 and 2021? So, uh, the IMF has um, has massively increased its um, its lending in the form of um, rapid financing instruments, uh, mostly to to low income countries in Africa, Asia, and, and the Middle East, and it's effectively provided financing to uh, to meet. Um, uh, balance of payment difficulties. Uh, this has also gone some ways to catalyzing the the participation of um, of uh, of private sector creditors. Uh, uh, and I think we've given something like, or we we have um, eighty one um, uh, programs um, this year. But as I said, mostly in um, 
in, in low-income countries. EMs, because of this um, massive increase in, in liquidity uh, from the advanced country central banks, you know, saw some uh, some some reduction in capital flows uh, to their to their economies around uh, March, April. But uh, these have since uh, stabilized, um, you know, reducing the need, um, at least for IMF type uh, type programs for most uh, for most emerging markets. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um... What's your opinion? Will the online jobs uh, and school learning uh, effects uh, have over a long-term perspective in the world economy? So, onlineization of everything uh, will it have a long time, uh, long-term effect on on the global economy? You know, I think this is a question more for for the World Bank that deals with kind of education as as, as their core mandate. I mean, what what I can offer is just. Um, uh, kind of, you know, my 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 own views on it, and just kind of watching um, watching this pandemic unfold. I mean, I think we're likely to see some form of digitalization remain. I mean, in the U.S., for example, a lot of the discussion is now around, you know, the need for four-year uh, university-type degrees at all. I think um, there's also a recognition in, in in some parts of the world. Uh, that perhaps there should be a, a bigger focus on, on vocational training. And so I think what, you know, the COVID pandemic has done is, you know, precipitate, precipitate and um, fast forward uh, uh, some, of these, um, some of these events. I mean, business schools, uh, for instance, now are also wondering what portion of their content um, they can take online if, for example, they can't, they can't travel um, to countries like they used to, like a lot of business schools were affiliated uh, for example, with companies in France or, or companies in Asia. And a big part of the program was um, taking students there uh, to look at practices. So I guess the question is, you know, can you do this digitally? And I think it will really just depend on, um, on, on how uh, educational institutions adapt. And uh, I, know I, I would hazard that, you know, that they will adapt. Some form of digitalization will remain, but... Uh, there's probably no taking away from face-to-face um, -face interaction. Uh, perhaps another angle is, uh, again, an inequality type angle. I think um, digitalization, uh, you know, presumes everybody has equal access, you know, to things like internet. And uh, I, I don't think we can take this for granted um, in, in some of our low-income countries. Uh, so, so I don't see, you know, a complete change in... Um, in, in what um, educational, uh, uh, I guess, services will be. But of course, the, you know, there will be tweaks towards kind of more, digital, more digitalization and also more vocalization. Um, and here I don't mean voice, I mean uh, vocational training um, in, in some of our uh, education programs. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, there is another question about remittances. Uh, so can you comment a bit more on the trends in migrants' remittances uh, which have void uh, low-income households in the previous crisis? Uh, did the remittances recover from uh, the Q2 uh, trough? So I, remittances um, have recovered, but also not, not back to... Um, not back to to, to pre-pandemic levels. Um, I think where uh, economies have been most hit, I, I had mentioned the Philippines. It's also a, a country that's um, that's very um, that's very dependent on remittances, uh, and with 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 the hit to, um, to to growth in the Middle East and the lockdown. I mean, obviously, we've seen um, a reduction in remittances, but the trends for remittances basically follow the, the trends in um, other BOP items. Uh, so we've seen some pickup in remittances um, over the summer, but this has um, this has leveled off. Uh Thanks. Actually, I myself also have a question and I will use the privilege of moderator to ask it. Uh, so if uh, we compare the response of IMF on the previous crisis and uh, the crisis that we have now, what are the major differences? May you list a couple of uh, two, three differences to major distinctions between uh, the IMF's response uh, nowadays and uh, 11 years ago?
thanks, Igor. I think uh, my question will uh, will kind of repeat some of the things I said earlier uh, to the question on you know what role the IMF has played in um, helping uh, current account adjustments across countries. I think what's what's been unique um, for the IMF is just how fast uh, programs have. Um, have been dispersed uh, and, and put in place for countries. So we, we have this rapid financing instrument, which we didn't have um, 11 years ago, that, that basically provides direct support to, uh, to low-income countries hit by the shock. It's, um, it's a financing instrument that doesn't um, include conditionality, for instance. So none of the, mm, the more, I guess, traditional um, IMF type longer program uh, adjustment, it literally was just a, um, direct financing support and I think um, that's been uh, the new feature of, of IMF support in in this particular crisis. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, so I have just one request for intervention slash comments. Uh, Professor Lenin Grigoriev uh, wanted to, to make a comment uh, so I will uh, give the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, sorry for joining a little bit later. I was driving in the morning <laughs> to, to the computer. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, Ms. Kiobi came again. Uh, excellent presentation, very educative. Uh, I should say that I'm reading IMF reports since 1980. Uh, we're getting better and better. Uh, and uh, we have a team which is working on many aspect, aspects which we uh, uh, discussed today and October outlook of the IMF uh, is given by us to all students in masters and even in bachelor's uh, classes uh, for uh, education and for practical uh, needs on specific topics. Uh, I have, uh, I will be presenting results of some of our work tomorrow morning, uh, but I have a couple remarks if you could comment on it or not it's as you wish. Um, first, um, we understand and you confirm that your date in the outlook is August. Uh, we have seen a third quarter for the United States for some other countries, but basically it's a problem of second wave of coronavirus in Europe. So we believe that probably uh, outlook for uh, this year and for next year will be a bit down on the next revision. Second, just because of uh, second wave of coronavirus and because uh, Europe, uh, Mediterranean cannot open tourism. Uh, we know that Spain, Italy and France is down a few points against the rest of Europe. Uh, so without uh, tourism and everything, it's hard to expect a recovery. Uh, your first forecast uh, outlook in April was based on the short pandemic and uh, oil stability. Now we have oil stability, but we have long uh, pandemic. Uh, so the question, remark and question is, uh, do you think that the opening of tourism in uh, these three big uh, developed and the same time tourist countries uh, is the key for European recovery? If we have still pandemic next year, uh, until summer, uh, it will be a problem for you. Thank you. Annette, we do not hear you. Wrong question. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, now. Oh, yes. you wish, Leonid Grieg. <laughs> Not the wrong question. Great question. Um, I actually just um, I mentioned to you because you were prescient about this black swan. I remember your interventions from last year, and here we are. What did you know that uh, that the rest of us didn't know? Um, <laughs> 
call me in private. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, in in response to to your question about about the European outlook, um, yes, I mean, I think, I mean. The European outlook, I mean, it's likely that we're going to tweak it a little bit. I mean, how much further down, um, I don't know. But I think what I want to say is that relative to even um, October or August when we did our projections, we do have uh, positive news on, on the vaccine front. So this kind of puts at least uh, a floor under um, how far how far down our, our projections can go. And I think mm, our assumptions, at least in, in, in the next WIO, is that we're, we're not only uh, likely to see uh, vaccine production, but also um, vaccine distribution uh, sometime next year. Uh, so, I don't know, it's, it's too early for me to comment on, on, you know, exactly which way our projections are going to go, but I, I don't expect um, massive, um, massive downward uh, revisions. Uh, but I, I, I do take your point that, um, you know, kind of in the absence of, of a vaccine, you're likely not, not going to see um, uh, you know the the tourism sector um, rebound, um, but it's also I mean it's it's a big part of the the, the, the Spanish, the Italian, the Portuguese, the Greek economy. Mm, but for example, Germany, for instance, uh, isn't so dependent on on tourism. So you know it it will help with with bringing up um, the, the the European projection. But of course, for for the for the more tourist uh, dependent economies. The, you know the, their growth prospects do heavily uh, depend on on the trajectory of um, of the COVID pandemic. But let's see how they do with this um, second wave of infections, and we'll see what happens over December. Um, we'll know a bit more later. Oh, Christmas uh, will bring a third wave. You, so you, I know. Yeah, I've, I've, I've. Everything um, I've read is that the peak of the second wave is is behind us. Uh, just kind of extrapolating for what from what the the first wave looked like, and uh, kind of both well, not both so almost all of Europe went into a lockdown that was probably as stringent um, as we saw in in March April uh, for a month or so 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 perhaps um, th this will help uh, with, with flattening the curve thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, thanks a lot, Annette. Uh, so we are already uh, behind the schedule a little bit, and so we understand Sorry. that you also have a very tough schedule and a lot of different events and meetings and so on. Uh, so we are very grateful uh, to you for um, making this speech, and uh, which was really very uh, educative and insightful. And uh, we hope for our uh, further uh, like joint events and so your um, participation in our conferences and including the conference next year, which probably and I hope so will be more optimistic uh, than this one. Uh, anyway, will it be live, Professor much. Makarov? Is the question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I cannot promise I, much of optimism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so you introduced the uh, elements of optimism right now. Uh, that's, that's great. Uh, thanks a lot, Annette. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so now we are continuing, I think, and I'm switching to Russian.